Good morning. I think I'm up and running. Is that right? The microphone's working? Everything's good. Well, what a joy to be with you this morning and to see the church in action, to see the church as she is supposed to be, to be able to be comfortable enough in the body of Christ to share those details, Karen, this morning. Now, we're all partners now in that prayer request. It's not just for the moments that we're here and for your request and for yours and uh, the requests that travel the miles to Trinidad and Tobago. We're, we're confident that we're part of God's great plan. We're not here by accident. There, there are many things in life, perhaps, that we could attribute to coincidence, but when we are the children of God, there are no coincidences, or a rose by any other name is still a rose, so call it what you like, but we are in the plan of God. We are in his hands, and uh, he, he does not make us like a robot. He gives us free will to operate within his providence and his sovereignty, and what a plan that is. I, I couldn't think of a better plan, actually. I couldn't think of a better plan that gives satisfaction to the God of our creation, to be able to see that when he created us and when man, the best of his creation, actually fell and disobeyed, that his son would be the provision for a redeemed human nature and a redeemed humanity. And then with Jude, in that great doxology, one chapter, 24, 23, 24 verses, he said, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his Father with great joy, to him be glory and power and majesty forever and ever. Amen. That's amazing. That is amazing because when he presents us without fault and with great joy, it's the finished work. It's in spite of the fall. It's in spite of the temptations to wander. It's in spite of all of the things that happen to us that he is able to present the finished work to his Father. I think that is amazing. Keep that in mind. Pastor John, Colleen, thank you for uh, your ministry here. A long time of service. And this afternoon, after a, a time of fellowship, we will conduct the regular review of the pastor and the church board, and I'm looking forward to that. But I just want to say thank you to both of you for your faithful ministry, to the family as well, to the kids. Can we call you kids these days? I'm not sure if that's politically correct or not. But, uh, and to you, the congregation here, may the Lord bless you. I visited your website this week. I love it. That's a great website one of the best that we have, and uh, so I, I really appreciate that. Happy birthday to you, John. 70. That is great. I just celebrated the big 6-0 a few weeks ago, and it nearly killed me. So <laughs> I need some advice from you. I need some counsel as I enter this lap, and uh, God bless you, and congratulations on this milestone. Who are we? That's the question, I think, that uh, is being asked around the world these days. Who are we? You know, um, w whether I am Charlie, I wish I could pronounce it in French, or whether I am, uh, yes, thank you, uh, whoever I am, it's a question of identity these days. Uh, righteousness is qualified by identity. Unrighteousness is qualified and interpreted by identity. Everybody wants to be somebody, and somebody wants to make a difference in our world, whether it is for good or whether it is for evil. Somebody wants to make a difference. Now, since we're all somebodies, that means that responsibility is placed on our shoulders as well. But the somebody that we are, if we were to say it in French, 
so beautifully that I am not Charlie, I am not Jew, I am Jesus. How dare I? How dare I say that? Je suis Jesus. I am Jesus. Is that taking poetic liberty to the extreme? It could be if we're not actually. But in many regards, it is the most accurate statement of the believer because Jesus is within us. Every word, every action, every thought, every deed, everything, every decision is controlled and directed by the Jesus that is within me. That's really what our identity is. And so I would ask you to stand for a moment as we hear the word of God from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 and uh, verse 3 to verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 11. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us, Karen, who comforts us in all our troubles. So that, here's the reason, so that we can comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort that we received from God when we were in trouble. I think this is a great passage because oftentimes we ask the question, well, why me? Why do I have to go through this? Why, 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 why does this have to fall upon my shoulders? The reason is so that the same comfort that we receive in that trial, we will be able to offer to somebody else who will go through it next week or who will go through it a year from now. It's a fantastically powerful passage. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ, our comfort overflows. It's who we are. If we are distressed, it's for your comfort and for your salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces patience and endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Now, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the hardships that we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of our very lives. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, the reason Paul says that, he could have finished with those words, we, we do not rely on ourselves, but we rely on God. That would probably have been enough to get the message across. But he adds a few words. The few words he adds are, this God who raises the dead. Why does he say that? Because if he can raise the dead, he can do anything. If he can raise the dead, he can fix our problem. If he can raise the dead, there isn't another issue in the world that humanity faces that he could not deal with. It's not just a filler here. It is a powerful uh, message to conclude what he's trying to say. And then for today, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril. He will deliver us. And on him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us 
in answer to the prayers of many. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. That really is the message today, and it's, it's very appropriate. <laughs> Derek came to me before service and you know, wanted to know if I had a script or wanted to know if I had a sermon title. I said, Derek, I, I really, I've, I, not yet, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, I've got a Bible full of them there that we could preach at any given point but I just don't know. And then a couple of minutes before service, I just went back to him and, and gave him what I've shared with you today. And now I know why. You see, this whole idea of identity is, is something that we all wrestle with. There are programs on TV that talk about young people struggling for identity. There, there, there's people in midlife struggling for identity. There, there's people at every stage of the journey, struggling for identity. There's a person who's just turning 70 who's now going to have a new identity. <laughs> really, what's in a number? Well, there's a lot of things in a number. I, I know people say, well, it's only a number. You, you are as old as you feel yeah. or as young as you feel. I get that. I understand. But numbers are significant because numbers are the things that are going to be on your tombstone. They're going to show the day you came in. They're going to show the day you left. And there's a whole lot in between those two sets of numbers that will never be able to be told on that uh, granite headstone or whatever it is. And yet it is something that we carry with us. The identity of a person is highlighted usually at a funeral service. Because that's when we hear all of the great stories and tributes. That's when we hear all of the eulogizing of that person's life. But there is so much more that is not said in those moments. And it's in this section that I want to concentrate today because that really is our identity. It is who we are. The reality of what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, remember who the Corinthians were. They were a church that felt that they had it all together. They really were a super spiritual church. You go in there, you just, in fact, you probably would be able to describe them as uh, Pentecostal. I don't mean Pentecostal because it's a denominational title. I mean, they were probably Pentecostal from the original experience uh, in the book of Acts. But there was something that was wrong with them. They had gifts, and, and they had a lot of graces, and they had a lot going for them, but the Apostle Paul, in the first letter that he wrote to them, interrupts the flow of congratulations and inserts a chapter that we have come to know as the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, which begins to remind us all of the necessity of love in spite of all of the other great things that we might have. We, we might have the power to do this and the power to do that, and, and we may be able to celebrate how great we are at this, that, and the other. But Paul says, if you don't have love, if we do not have that love, we really have nothing. Everything else that we do just sounds like a big gong. It sounds like a clanging cymbal. And a, a clanging cymbal is one of the most annoying instruments. Isn't that right, Colleen? It is one of the most annoying instruments in the orchestra. And it's not meant to be used all the time. It is only meant to be used sparingly. And I'm not looking at you to blame you. I, I, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm looking at you because you're a great drummer. But it is to be used in the right place at the right time. If you clash those all the time, well, we'll empty this house in a minute. And so Paul is saying, look, I want you to understand the reality of what this identity is all about. What the identity is all about boils down to three things, and we're so glad as preachers it always boils down to three things. One is that our God has helped us. He has helped us. There's a litany of history. We just go back over history. We go back over our testimony, and we remember what it is that God has really done for us. He has helped us. Think back in your own life to the things and the measure of things that God has helped you with. It's what we call a testimony. 
It's what we call the great grace of God. And in the church, I would hope and pray that in every one of our churches, we would never lose our memory. We would never lose the memory of what God has done for us. So often in this modern era, or what has become known as the postmodern era, and I'm not into all that. I'm, I'm not good at that, defining a, a societal condition, but, but except for sin and righteousness. But wherever we are in this spectrum of history, we can never do without reflecting on the goodness of God and what He has done for us. Those little insignificant things that are only insignificant, perhaps, to others, but are game changers for every one of us. Those are the things we need to remember. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who crowneth thy life with loving kindness and good things. Those are the things that we need to be reminded of, that in this day, when we put our head to the pillow tonight, in this day, God has enormously blessed us. The very fact that we were able to get out this morning and get out of bed this morning and get dressed and eat and come to this place. We've heard already in our prayer requests and testimonies this morning, there are some people who just can't do it. They just can't do it. And the prayers of many will bring about the great faith that the history of God in the history of the world is something that must never be forgotten. I've been on a real health binge the last few years, and uh, my wife, uh, for Christmas, bought me a Fitbit. Among other things, I should say, she bought me a Fitbit. You know what a Fitbit is? It's great. It's this black, elaborate rubber band that I wear on my wrist. And, and it, it tells me just about everything that I've done today or yesterday. And my goal is to, you know, lose some more weight. And they, it tells me that I'll do it if I walk 10 kilometers a day. And uh, it's going to tell me, it's going to tell me when that happens. And, you know, I, I've been doing it since Christmas. I've been doing it since I, I got this. And, and uh, I was exercising before, but I really wasn't sure, you know, how effective it was. Now I kind of know. Program it into the iPhone, and I know that, wow, it is going to tell me how many more steps I need to take to reach my goal today, how many calories I've burned. It even tells me how I slept last night. It tells me how many minutes I was restless, how many minutes I was awake, how many minutes I slept. It is amazing. It, 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 I tell you what, you talk about Big Brother. Well, here it is. Welcome to Big Brother. The beautiful thing is this, that there is a point every day, it usually happens about 3, 30, 4 o'clock every day, when the bells and whistles on this Fitbit just start to go off. The lights flash. There's a vibration on my wrist. It's as if all of heaven rejoices that I have reached my 10 kilometers. <laughs> and I've still got seven hours of awake to do what is needed extra. And it's a tremendous thing because it's, it's a rejoicing over what has been accomplished today. And I feel absolutely awful when I don't get to do it. I, I don't, we stayed in Chatham last night. And so in the hotel this morning, where am I going to go to get started? Because usually before the day starts, I've already got half my kilometers in. So where am I going to go? The gym wasn't open, so I'm pacing up and down the hotel room. I'm glad the windows weren't open because I look kind of odd, you know. But at the end of the day, I look at what has happened and I rejoice. I think Fitbit, reverently speaking, is a good example of what my Lord does with me. He knows far more about me than the Fitbit does. And I don't need to program into a phone, a smartphone, to figure out what I've done. And whenever things get accomplished, Let's never forget that angels in heaven are rejoicing. All the lights are going off. The, the bells and whistles are being blown. The, the angels are rejoicing over one person who has come to know Christ, maybe because of my efforts or your efforts. And Paul here, one who was traveling all over Asia Minor, says to the Corinthians, listen, I don't want you to ever forget 
that the history of God in the life of the human being is one that shall never be forgotten. Our Lord has helped us. And then he says, and he will help us. Now, I was okay at English at school, but I do recognize that the word will is a present tense will. It's also future. Now, we'll deal with the future in the third part. But in the second part, the word will means that he is currently, he is, he is in this moment helping me. He's helping me to see good things when I look out at you. He's helping me to hear good things. He's helping me to recognize that there's a, a future to be had. There's a present to enjoy and there's a past to support it all. Never lose the joy and the power of this moment because you are preoccupied by what might be coming. Look at our world. Who in their right mind could look at the world right now and say, wow, what a wonderful world this is, except for the hope of Christ. Except for the hope of Christ. Nobody in their right mind could say, this is a wonderful world, unless we knew what the end of the story already was. And the end of the story is that the Lord is coming back to receive his church. He's coming back to receive those who have given their hearts to Jesus. And that's what we are all about in the church of Jesus Christ. We're all about prayer. We're all about support. We're all about carrying each other's burdens. But we are about the kingdom of God and its expansion. It's expansion. Dr. Bob Broadbooks is the regional director of the USA Canada for the Church of the Nazarene. And he was a speaker, he was the speaker at our clergy retreat, and he shared a statistic amongst, I don't know, 60, 70 clergy who were there and their spouses. And the statistic that he shared was this, that in the last 12 months, last January to December 2014, 52,000, almost 52,000 people in churches of the Nazarene, just like this, all over this continent, gave their heart to Jesus. 52,000. Now, your response was better than the response of a group of pastors. The group of pastors, of which I was one, we kind of gave this little closet clap, you know. Little royal, little royal clap. Now, I heard a few amens here this morning, but I want to say it again. Almost 52,000 people gave their hearts to Jesus last year in churches of the Nazarene, just like this. Now, we should be dancing, we should be rejoicing. We should be elated by that statistic, but I don't think we are. I really don't think we are. Now, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to go personal here on you because I'm part of the problem as well. We become sometimes so jaded. Sometimes we become so skeptical. Sometimes we become so, oh, really? Been there, done that, heard it, seen it, ah, right. Right. Let's wait and see. God forgive us. God forgive me for that attitude. Instead, if the angels are rejoicing over what God is doing in this present moment, in churches all over this province and Quebec and North America and around the world, then people, let's recognize that that's what this is really all about because one day Jesus is coming back. Let's not lose sight of that. He is coming back to this broken world and he's going to extract the believer from it. Now, I'm not getting into end times prophecy here. I'm giving you uh, prophecy 101 because beyond that, I cannot go. And in this moment, we are enjoying it because it's in this moment he could come back. In this moment, that sky could open. In this moment, there could be the presence of Jesus to call up his church. Now that moment's gone, but it's this moment. Now that moment's gone. Wait a minute, it could happen. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, okay, you've got all the gifts. Great. You've got a good church. Great. You've got people who are just piling in those doors. Great. But I want you to know 
that your confidence is not in an organizational skill. It's not in how professionally the bulletin has been put together. It's not in how well we sing or how poorly we sing. It's not in how well the preacher preaches or how badly he or she preaches. It's because the Lord is our helper and our comfort, and he is here now to bless us. The Lord has helped us, testimony time. The Lord is helping us, testimony time. And we know, says Paul, that he will continue to help us. He will continue to help. There's no change in his plan. There's never a time when we can get God so annoyed that he'll say, do you remember in Corinthians I said I was going to help you? Well, I've changed my mind. Never a time when that'll happen. That might happen to us. That might happen to humanity, but it never happened to God. He is faithful to his word. He will always help us. And if we think for one minute that the power of God has somehow been diluted Let's think again, because the power of God is still able to save anybody, everybody, wherever they are. At our zone rally a few weeks ago, I shared about revival meetings I had at Rosewood Church. I went there for seven nights to preach what I thought was a revival series to the believer. God had other plans during that week, and during that week, there were several people who gave their hearts to the Lord for the first time. There was a girl in that back right-hand corner, right hand from me, Melissa, Air Canada flight attendant, had been on hard drugs for four years. She saw the program being live streamed from Rosewood Church. She lived in High Park. She got on the bus and the subway and another bus and made it over to the church and gave her heart to Jesus in one of those services and then testified to it before the week was out. A guy by the name of John down there in the left-hand corner came through the door. He had been a backslidden guy. He had walked away from God. It, it, his marriage, he'd lost his marriage over it. He had become an alcoholic, and he stood right here during a healing service and came back to Jesus. I came away from that week of services. My heart was renewed. My faith was restored. My belief in the sovereignty and power of God was lifted to a level it hasn't been at for a long, long time. We need to believe again. We need to resurrect the identity of the Christian, which is not a naive optimism. It's not a, oh, I feel that something good is about to happen. You know, that old Gaither song? Great song, by the way. I just don't like it. It's a good song. And the reason I don't like it is it has been folklorized. It's been folklorized. And in the church, there's a lot of things that become folklore. There's a lot of things that become, oh, you know, I'll pat you on the shoulder, hang in there, let go, and suddenly we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. There's a lot of things that become Hollywoodized in the church as well. There's a lot of things that become airbrushed in the church. There's a lot of things that we are actually swept along in a current of unreality. But the church is the greatest reality show on earth. It really is. Our media is filled with reality shows. They're popular. They get good viewership. But this is the reality show right here. Where today the Lord Jesus Christ can touch you in a way that you've never been touched. Whether you're in agony, whether you're in emotional, mental, physical agony, the Lord is able not only to help you as a legacy, to help you as a present reality, but to give us the confidence and the knowledge. It's as if it's a done deal. It's already done. You can go to the bank with the promise of God that he will continue, continue to help us. And to God be the glory.
The power of God is upon us for a reason. And the reason is this, that we are people of two kingdoms. We are people in this world of the kingdom of God, but we are people of the kingdom of heaven. We're not of this world, but we are in it. We are people of two kingdoms. We are people of one Lord. That's all, all there is to it. There's one Lord and one master, and you cannot serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and cleave to the other. And we are people of no compromise. Because once we begin to compromise our faith and compromise our life, then the floodgates of evil will begin to wash us away. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory on to victory, from victory, not to victory, on to, we're fighting from a position of victory already. So from victory to victory, his army he shall lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Who are we? I am Jesus. Oh, I know it's going out on the air and people who would just tune into the last 30 seconds of that would think I'm some kind of an imposter, so I'm not. Jesus lives within me. Therefore, my life demonstrates his presence. Please don't misunderstand what I've said. On March 13, 2013, George Bergoglio's life changed forever. George Bergoglio, just a common man who was used of God to become Pope Francis. Two years now into that papacy, he's tried to revolutionize, he's tried to do whatever, whatever you think about papacy and all the rest of that. I, I know this, that after his election, he was uh, asked the question, what name do you want to take? And he took St. Francis of Assisi. He took that name to perhaps illustrate his own life and his own mission. And then they dressed him in the papal gowns and led him into a little room off the Sistine Chapel called the Room of Tears. And in that tiny little room, I've never been to it, but I've been told, tiny compared to everything else in Vatican City, he knelt down and he prayed what was described by the media as a symbolic prayer taking the mantle of responsibility for 2.6 million Catholics around the world. But in an interview later, there was no symbolic prayer about it, he declared. He suddenly realized the weight of responsibility in that little room of tears that he had just taken upon himself. I believe every Christian goes into a personal room of tears every day to realize the weight of responsibility that each one of us has taken upon ourselves to make a difference in the world in which we live. Who are we? That's who we are. People who have decided to follow Jesus and spread the word which is truth to every man, woman, boy, and girl. Let's continue to do it to his glory. May the Lord bless you. Amen.